Welcome, uh, all of you, for being here. Uh, uh, I, I'm super, super, super excited about this and the events that follow the, you know, the rest of the day. Uh, my name is Hector Amaya. I'm the director of the uh, School of Communication here at Annenberg. And um, I am, I'm, I am thr thrilled to have you here. I am happy, those of you who are students, how many of you are students? Awesome. Thank you for being here on a Friday. This is actually deep down, deep down, this is an educational opportunity. And you're welcoming education on Friday. That's fantastic. The rest of you, welcome to, uh, to USC. Welcome to Annenberg. Uh, let me introduce, uh, um, or m let me do a few remarks, actually, starting with uh, uh, something that happened to me last night. You know, I have a nine-year-old. His name is Javier. He's in fourth grade. And yesterday after school, he had a play date. We brought a, brought, brought a friend to our house, and they were playing outside, and uh, the uh, play date ended badly. He was shot in the eye with a, with a Nerf gun. <laughs> he was fine, but he was crying, and he was upset, and he was angry, and his friend and him departed in, well, in not pleasant terms. Um, we had dinner immediately after. And, uh, and I was serving him something that he didn't love for dinner. So this simply added injury or pain to the injury. He was not happy. He was a grumpy, grumpy, grumpy little boy. So it occurred to me that what I could share with him is the fact that today we actually had a dance contest and a K-pop contest. And I asked him, um, do you know what K-pop is? And he said, no. What is that? Mm. I live in Mount Washington. It's mostly Latino and, 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 and white neighborhood. He hasn't had uh, the exposure to K-pop. So I fixed this by actually bringing uh, my computer to the table where, when we were having dinner. Open uh, YouTube uh, as uh, Kingdom uh, K-pop. Uh, and suddenly we had a stream of videos after the first one. He was paying his close attention. He began even eating garbanzos one by one. I could see his demeanor changing, you know. He finished the, uh, the first song, another one. Okay, I have to keep clicking another one. We spent like an hour and a half watching K-pop. And he, by the end of the evening, it was remarkable. Two things you should know about my son. If you ask him on Wednesday what his favorite music is, he will tell you undoubtedly He's very sure about this. Imagine Dragons, number one. Billie Eilish, number two. Kingdom ended up number two after last night. He's still skipping Imagine Dragons up there. But uh, Billie Eilish, uh, alas, was demoted. <laughs> I tell you this because, you know, I see in my son actually the, 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 the power of music. I see the power of music to bring people together. I see the power of music to connect us. I was thinking about the fact that actually, what are the odds that today he won't be in the playground arguing on behalf of K-pop to all his friends and telling them, what, you know what K-pop is? What kind of person are you? What kind of person are you? I was thinking that actually he would be figuring out actually how to connect with his Korean American friends. And he would say, ah, you know what? We love something similar. We love the same thing. We are similar at this very, very basic level. Music is uh, unique in that sense. Music is unique in the sense that actually gives us a strong identity. But it is not a world identity. It's an identity that allows us to reach out, to touch others, to make them friends. It is incredible. How is it that music actually does that? Perhaps only second to food. Food also does that in my, in my, in, in my view. Perhaps the next time one, uh, hey Jean, perhaps the next uh, event will be about music, uh, uh, sorry, about food. Let me finish actually uh, just welcoming all of you for being here, thanking you for being here. Uh, I'm super excited about the events in the, in the whole of the afternoon and evening. Uh, and I am so thankful actually to the uh, to the uh, co-sponsors of this event uh, for helping us organize this. 
And I want to do a special thanks to uh, Professor He Jin Lee for being the, uh, the dynamo, the visionary, the, who constructed uh, these connections, who made them happen. And here we are. You know, it is incredible, He Jin. <laughs> Seriously, thank you so much. We owe you a great, great deal for bringing us together and making this magic happen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank, uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's my honor to have uh, co-host this uh, important event with USC. First of all, I, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to today's academic forum, fo focusing on the question of what does global means for K-pop. This uh, central topic immediately uh, reminds me of a famous quote from the co uh, great Korean in independence leader, Kim Go, who said, I wish for our nation to become the most beautiful nation in the world. The only thing that I desire infinitely is the power of a noble, con noble culture. This is because the power of culture both make us happy and give happiness to others. Well, I believe that the global phenomenon uh, known as K-pop is succeeding in bringing ha happiness to everyone in the world. It has become a wonderful phenomenon also. So K-pop, including K-drama, K-cinema, K-beauty, K-food, and the like continues to captivate and engage fans from all corners of the world. And while K-pop exposes fans to many aspects of Korean culture and language, it also serves as a universal language through which fans are able to form strongly knit communities. So I hope that this forum uh, offers many insights into the power of culture in connecting people and K-pop's central role in bringing, bringing people together through diversity and versatility. This forum uh, is the beginning of a continuing partnership with and, and exchange with USCC and Korean Cultural Center. And I would like to thank everyone at USC for their efforts in organi organizing this important event. Thank you so much. 감사합니다. Hello, I'm Henry Jenkins. I'm from, I teach in the School of Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism and in the Cinematic Arts School. And I'm happy to help welcome you to this event today, which I've been eagerly waiting for. Waiting for. I end up working on a lot of dissertations in the East Asian studies side of things, which have become a really good partner for many, pro many of the students that we work on. Uh, most of my interest is more in K-cinema and K-television. I, I admit that I'm the person on the stage who knows the least about K-pop, although I probably had that similar video experience uh, we were just hearing about, so I've been introduced to it, but I have no expertise. But luckily, we've got an array of incredible graduate students here at, at USC who are in a variety of divisions doing work that touches on K-pop as part of their dissertation and thesis research. And so we're going to meet them today and drill into some of these questions. The most important one is what is global about global hip-hop? What does that mean? What is its implications? So why don't we start here, Becky, and work our way around. And if you just introduce yourself, say a little, you know, a minute or two about your research, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Professor. Hi, everybody. My name is Becky Pham. I am currently a fourth year PhD candidate at the Annabelle School for Communication. And so I conduct research on children, family communication, and their media use. Specifically, I want to look at how their media use and engagement with popular culture affects their family interactions and identities. 
Yeah. Okay. You, it looks like everyone's got one. Okay. Mm -hmm. huh. Hi. Uh, my name is Ray Kyung Ra. I'm a second year PhD student at the USC Cinematic Arts School. Um, my research centers around transnational media theory, performance, and queer theory. Um, and I used to work at back in Korea in um, television and digital media industry, um, also worked as a performer, dancer, and my dissertation research focuses also on that. And just a quick um, selfless plug, I do have an <laughs> article coming out in December about Squid Game and Orientalism, if you are interested in that topic. Thank you very much. Okay, congratulations on the article. Um, uh, so my name is Tiara. I am a second year in the PhD pro department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Uh, my research focuses largely on negotiations of race and identity in East Asian popular culture. So I do a lot with um, embedded blackness and black culture and as it relates to Chinese hip hop and K-pop. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Angie Chang, and I'm a master's student at USC Thornton School of Music. Um, I'm majoring in music industry, but I took a leave of lessons from 2020 to see what's actually like in the industry. So I worked at um, this global fandom, K-pop, uh, global K-pop global fandom platform in Korea. And after that, I also worked as a production manager of albums and vid music videos. And now I'm currently working as um, international manager for um, this company called The Black Label under YG Entertainment. Um, I just flew from Korea for this event. <laughs> and oh yeah, I also want to say that um, all the responses from me today is based on my personal experience. So I'm not talking on behalf of my company, but yeah, um, thank you for having me today. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Hyeju Lee. I am a third year PhD student in East Asian Languages and Cultures at Dorn Sai with Tierra. Um, and my uh, main focus of research is Korean cinema and media more broadly. Um, but specifically, I really look at issues of also new media and like media theory and how that relates to sort of um, this, the field of cinema more broadly in Korea. Um, and yeah, in my studies, it's hard not to uh, think about K-pop and the larger uh, Korean wave. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, so let's start with a question that's on the board behind us. What does global mean for global K-pop? Uh, and I mean, I think there are two levels of that. First, what does it literally mean? What are we talking about when we're talking about the global here? And then secondly, what are its implications? What long term is the meaning or significance of a turn toward the global? So who would like to start us off on that? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> I, I guess I can start. <laughs> Um, so I think that for me, when I think of what makes K-pop global, I think it largely obviously has to do with the circulation of the media, right? We have fans all over the world. But I think also the actual art form within K-pop is kind of global uh, because of the citational practices within K-pop, right? It's not like it's just kind of the self-existing musical form. Like when we talk about K-pop, it is largely you know, related to kind of 2000s and later, this kind of group idol band phenomenon. And that is largely, you can relate that back to MTV media culture, the centrality of the music video um, and the rise at that time, as well as various black sonic cultures like hip hop and the influence of hip hop and dance and contemporary dance. So there is like a lot of citational elements. And then there's also the inclusion of various cultural practices like there's sonically you hear a lot of sounds whether it's from like India which come brings up issues of cultural appropriation but it definitely is global in the sense that citationally references a lot of different um, cultural connections um, and musical genres in that sense so I think that like beyond just the circulation of the media it itself is a product with a lot of different global or country representations in it, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to add on. So it's really interesting, the citational globality, but uh, just again, add on. Um, it, I think hi like global history is also so implicated within K-pop. So for example, some of the earliest uh, iterations, iterations of uh, the Korean pop music industry was debatably uh, 
originating from like U.S. Army bases after the Korean War, which was from 1950 to 1953. And a lot of um, Korean musicians, performers went to these bases to perform for um, the U.S. military. And so oftentimes, uh, from what I know, they would purposefully emulate like popular American music and styles in order to cater for their audience. And you could see that also as a sort of like global history origin to yeah, K-pop as we know it today. Yeah, it's really interesting that you um, discuss like the history of global K-pop, because like you said, uh, we already see traces of it from like since 1945, the presence of Americans in Korea. But also it's like because now we're being aware of how global K-pop is, it's like K-pop has always been global to a certain degree, like J Japan, China, they have been like in Northeast Asian area, like it's always been a, a, you know, one of the biggest markets for K-pop. Even now, before it reached America, I think, before it reaches America, like to my knowledge, um, I think Latin America and also Southeast Asia are the biggest hubs of where like the consumer market is. It's really interesting to see that. And also adding on to that, <laughs> there, are issue, there are issues of, mm, I, I think we'll come back to this later in the panel, but like there are issues of like misinterpretation or interpretation. Um, have K-pop having its own life in different markets. Like for instance, because I specialize in queer theory, it's really fascinating to see how scholars and audiences here after being exposed to K-pop, they think Korea is such an LGBTQ friendly country. And I have to be like, absolutely not. <laughs> um, there's that issues of liminal masculinity, um, how people, how Western audiences see performance. So yeah, things that, though, I think those would be also interesting topics to touch on. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And I'm speaking as a long-time K-pop fan since the late 1990s when I was a kid in Vietnam and there was no internet, there was no social media, and there was no smartphones. And the only way that I managed to consume K-pop was uh, through Vietnamese television channels, reruns of Korean music show. And I, I would love to know where they got the shows from and why you know certain shows specifically. I still don't know. Maybe I need to go by and talk to my Vietnamese government. But oh. yes, so I think when... When we are talking about global here, we need to talk about global hybrid cultural values and the roles of the media. What I mean by uh, global values, I'm talking about the mesh up, the hybridity of Western and Asian cultures. So if we are talking about K-pop and K-drama in, uh, say, 2000s, when I started to become a really hardcore K-pop and K-drama fans, we would um, notice that K-dramas and K-pop used to be pure back then, you know what I'm saying? Like traditional family values and like cute concept, innocent concept. But these days, K-pop has become so globalized and maybe some would say that that equals to Americanized, right? You will see that more and more verses in K-pop song are in English, and there will be softcore cursing as well. For example, CL's Hello B, you know, <laughs> you know, and and so it has, and and even now we have group like Card, the co-ed group, um, that you know, it's not just K-pop, it's not just American music, but Latino music as well, and they are so popular in South America. So it is this. Um, evolving um, uh, mesh of, of cultures and, and the underlying expectation is that there needs to be a really large audience across borders, transnationalism, you know, and a lot of values such as diversity, inclusivity, you know, anybody can be a K-pop fan and we do not tolerate any form of discrimination. But then at the same time as uh, we talk a little bit about the tensions, the underlying tensions could be the clash between globalization and more regional nationalistic sentiments, for example, like in China and Vietnam, right? If you are a young K-pop fan, I conducted research on young K-pop fan in Vietnam, and I used to live in Vietnam and Singapore before I moved here. I have noticed that the older generation would frown upon young K-pop fans' desire to engage in this foreign 
um, out of the country's cultural trends and and what they means to them and when they are supposed to just be a kid going to school, you know, engaged in filial piety, you know, and not talk too much perhaps and learn Vietnamese instead of Korean or English, you know. So there's all of these tensions. Sorry, I talked too much, but thank you so much for all the great points. Um, yeah, to add on, um, people who didn't really know about K-pop or some of Western media um, describe K-pop as something that has randomly become became popular, but I personally don't think that's the case. But K-pop was designed in a way to match with global um, audiences' taste. Um, for example, training system. Um, when they're tra when the trainees come into the company, they learn different languages from English, Japanese, Chinese, and even Spanish these days. And having international members that also targets global market. Um, fourth, uh, most of the fourth generation girl group these days um, from big company, they all have international members for like IVE, ESPA, even New Jeans who just debuted last month. And also the industry, um, I mean, the company hires international songwriters, producers and choreographers for K-pop songs. Um, they hire it from like, from like non-Korean but international um, creatives. Um, these days, most of the billboard winning K-pop songs have international songwriters credits and producers credits. That's I think that's targeting for global market, and I yeah I think so. And also we also do marketing on marketing and pro promotions and for global markets too, like specific regions. We have specific types and specific marketing tactics for specific regions, and I think that adds on to why became why K-pop became so popular globally. So, yeah, that's my perspective. Well, let's, I'm going to follow Becky's lead to note that by global we don't just mean it's Korean music popular in the United States. Right? We live in a country where the World Series actually etches into Toronto, but doesn't go any broader than that. So it doesn't take much to impress Americans with the global reach of stuff. But as Becky's noting, there is a variety of nations uh, across Asia and Latin America that are coming together to form a kind of transnational fandom. So how are they resolving differences, or are they resolving differences, in order to celebrate this music together? What's, how does fandom become a space itself of globalization. Well, what differences are you seeing across some of these? I guess I can start by citing an example. I think the example that I would like to bring to our table here is the incident in early 2016 when one of the members of the TWICE girl group uh, I hope I pronounced her names correctly. She's from Taiwan. And I think in one television show in Korea, she waved the Taiwanese flag. And um, fans from mainland China were not happy. And so JYP, uh, her company, entertainment company, and she had to issue a video of her apologizing to fans in China saying that, um, I'm sorry, I did not... Mean, mean to uh, like uh, basically she was she said she supported the one China policy and so it create so much backlash and debates and arguments online about what it means for her as a Taiwanese um, idol working in K-pop where there are various national and cultural differences and tensions are emerging between Korea between China and, and Taiwan as well. And I'm not very sure whether the fandoms actually have any ways to resolve the conflict, but I would like to just highlight the way that the entertainment company try to solve this conflict, in this case, JYP Entertainment. So we don't know what exactly went on behind the scenes, but from the way that Tu issue her apology, I guess, and based on what I've read and on what other researchers in K-pop have been saying, I guess we can agree, at least to a larger extent, that 
Ji Yu as a Taiwanese idol when she was caught between the tensions. Um, she was caught in the tension between global capitalism and regional nationalism. So she was expected to behave like this global transnational pop star so that she could appeal to fans from so many countries. But then, but then when stuff happened, she was expected to become apolitical, if not to do whatever it takes to, you know, please the majority number of fans. Yeah, and of course, fans are going to continue to debate and maybe there will be other future incidents that happen that can get us talk about these kind of tensions before. But I think even as K-pop has become so global and so transnational, cultural, national differences are here to stay. Yeah, I think um, not to bring it back to America, but bringing it back to America. Um, I think that um, something that comes up a lot um, as far as like fandoms and addressing with uh, addressing issues of kind of circulation and cross cultural differences is uh, beauty standards. Um, I feel like there are quite a few like especially black. American K-pop fans who have had issues with the, the emphasis on like whiteness um, or thinness within beauty standards in the K-pop industry. And so in an attempt to kind of make a space for themselves in the fandom will explicitly try to find evidence that certain K-pop idols actually like non-Korean people, right? Um, like there's a, there are plenty of videos and stuff on like got, um, on got seven um, members like JB and Jackson and how much they love black women or like all of these other things of like intentionally trying to find ways to prove that there is space for, uh, for us within the fandom. Um, so I think that that is definitely a part of it. Um, but I also think that like, like using the community itself as a format to create um, authentic relationships. So like the fandom itself might recognize that um, some of the music or the things that the artists do can be controversial, but I think a lot of them don't dismiss uh, the artists and said they confront them through social media. Like um, one recent example I can think of is like August D's mixtape. Um, he, when he released it, there were some issues. Um, he put a sample from a pretty controversial interview on there. And fans were like, you shouldn't be doing this. This has racial tensions, etc." And it was removed immediately. So there's kind of this conversation or this dialogue that happens between fans and artists and the companies that I think that despite the kind of the explicit exclusion due to a lack of presence, a lack of black bodies or of um, more brown bodies too. I think that that open communication helps to deal with those issues and to resolve those conflicts or the appearance at least of that open communication does. Yeah, that's really interesting that you bring beauty standard up because that's like, that's also something, it's a part of Korean culture that's like very co like contested and criticized. And there are, I believe there are research that talk about how like you know, that kind of go, like, go against that kind of discourse, like how like whiteness or fairness with skin predates Western contact. Or things like, let's see, what was another thing that you brought up? I'm trying to... Thinness? Like, oh, thinness, yeah, like things like that. It's just, um, there are, it's a contested concept. It's like, and, and I, um, but I do understand what you're getting at at the moment. Oh, yeah, it's like, we, really, we don't really know the answer. It's, and also like that anti-blackness in Korea also, it, there are the, uh, there are research that shows like how contact with American GIs after 1945 also really left that kind of culture with the Koreans a lot. So it's like something to look into, definitely. A uh, like, very interesting discourse, and just and just to, like um, I don't know, not not it's it's well, it's not funny, but like if you go <laughs> if you go on Urban Dictionary, <laughs> there's a phrase that K-pop fans used to use, <laughs> um, but Namjoon, do you know? It's like, so like the, the BTS rapper, um, he used to have like a lot of misogynistic phrases like in his rap verses and the fans confronted him about it. And you know, he, 
And after that, you know, he started to like, you know, change what he puts in his lyrics, how he performs. And that's why the phrase, but Namjoon came to be, it was just circulated around the K-pop fans. Like, oh, but we, we can change him. You know, like, we, we can fix him. Like, it's like a sort of like that kind of attitude. Um, so yeah, definitely what you mentioned there is, you know, in the culture. Um, let's see, just, and like, not, like what I brought up earlier with like, uh, I guess like multi uh, or transnational tension that Becky mentioned, uh, talked about, that like the idea of queerness, you know, it's, um, if you know the phrase limit, like uh, liminal masculinity, it's this idea that in the Western culture, like um, Asian men are often effeminized and it's really interesting to see how like costuming or like makeup or these kind of beauty standards kind of play into that. People see performances and you know like there are like you know like harnesses or like <laughs> the makeup or like um, people see that and think oh that's so queer like it's like a it's such a queer way of performing but like that's that wouldn't be necessarily translated as feminine in the Korean culture and that's where like another like what I mean by misinterpret in misinterpretation you know, comes forth from. Um, one of my good friends from Europe, she's she's in the University of Braschwaf, I think. And I'm, I hope she doesn't mind me mentioning this, but like she's writing a chapter currently. She's doing like a quantitative research into like, <laughs> um, in on TikTok, how like um, male idols perform, like the number of times they bite their lower lips or like <laughs> how many, how many times they like gyrate their waist and how fans interpret that as like something queer or feminine. It's, and I would like, you know, the chapter is not out yet. <laughs> I know it's I'm like, the chapter is not out yet, but I read, I was able to read the um, draft. It was like, it's really amazing how like, the kind of misinterpretations or like how, I don't know, it's like how fans um, add life to what is hap like what they see visually. And that's like another example of like <laughs> a ten tension, I guess, like that I could talk about. Well, yeah. where, where can I sign up to watch those videos to oh, help you? <laughs> do you do TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's everywhere. <laughs> I like that you brought in the issue of like anti-blackness because I think it is also like Angie was talking about earlier the intentional like um, transnationality or internationality this kind of perceived multiculturalism in the construction of a lot of K-pop groups themselves in sense of having like someone who's from Thailand or also from Taiwan or all of those things but I feel like also in a lot of that you don't see as many still like black artists coming out and that you do see a lot of those tensions when there is um like there was the issue with uh, i believe it was like black swan that group recently yeah and the senegalese um the senegalese artist that was coming out and people branding her as like the first oh we have the first black k-pop star um and how that caused a, a big tension because she was kind of like oh well i'm not black i'm technically half Af african and was born in belgium and so it kind of created all these tensions but a lot of people said that she didn't really have the right right to claim k-pop to, to participate in k-pop um but i feel like a lot of those conversations don't come up as frequently when the artist is like let's say like chinese or um southeast asian right is that it's usually reserved when the, there is a very clear physical difference um, and so I think that is also something that like K-pop fans deal with as like a way of, it, it makes it plain that there is very clearly, despite this rhetoric of multiculturalism and internationalism, there is still underneath this tone of anti-blackness. So I appreciate you bringing that up, yeah. Um, and yeah, and just to add on too, like the sort of like Taiwanese members or you know Chinese, Japanese, they are all like East Asian and of a very specific like let's be real, like a light skin kind of yeah, um, phenotype. Um, and even someone like like Lisa from Blackpink, who's from Thailand, she's also not. You can't quite tell sometimes, right? And and so I think there definitely is this calculated, um, yeah, kind of cosmetic image of multiculturalism, which, as yeah, my colleagues were saying, um, is yeah problematic sometimes, especially if it is purporting a very kind of equal and, and yeah, multicultural image. Yeah. It's really, like, it's also interesting that you, like, the mo word multiculturalism. So in Korea, it doesn't, it doesn't really have a positive connotation necessarily. The word tamunha, it, it's usually used to, like, connote mixed families of, like, you know, like Southeast Asian, 
like um, that, that we perceive as economically backwards, you know? So the word itself doesn't really have a positive connotation in Korea. And there's, as we all, like as Heju and Tiara mentioned, that colorism, that issue of colorism is there. And also, like if you are, if you're a lighter skin and if you can blend in, I guess, you're much better accepted. And also the language part, like there's definitely racism and colorism there. Like, um, pe um, I don't know, like, Caucasian actors who can't speak Korean still get like jobs. It's a it's a labor issue as well. But like you know the like you know this per and there are of course like um, Black Amer. I, I, I'm not sure if he's Black Amer. No, he's not Black American. Oh, I forgot his name. There's that one. The model. Oh, the model. <laughs> Is he? He's mixed, right? Half Nigerian, I think. Half Nigerian, yeah. He's like I mean he also speaks the language so fluently and like. <laughs> Exactly, he's Korean. Like, he, I think he speaks Korean better than like English. I think so. It's like that's how people fit into the culture. How that's how they're accepted. So there's that issue of language, um, like how well they assimilated to Korean culture, colorism. It's all there. Thank you so much for bringing the point about the tensions between how Koreans perceive Southeast Asians and, you know, how Southeast Asians perceive themselves and perceive Korea. Um, so as a Southeast Asian, I think that um, migration also plays an important part in this. You know, we have been talking about transnational, about where a person grew up, you know, and their ethnicity. And so when talking about K-pop being global, we, we cannot ignore um, international migration. So me as a Vietnamese, um, as of now, uh, last time I checked, there are at least 100,000 South Koreans in Vietnam. And Vietnam's population is about 80 million people. So that, that's quite a sizable group of people. And um, one of, in one of the articles that I've read, the journalists argue that the reason why so many South Koreans are moving to Vietnam right now is because Vietnam reminds them of South Korea 20 years ago. So there's just so much promises in terms of the economic, cultural front, you know, so many opportunities f to open factories, retailing, manufacturing, technology, research and development. And so why not going into somewhere less competitive and more promising and so eager to succeed? Yep. And at the same time, there are many people, foreigners, moving into South Korean as well. And again, if we are talking about Vietnamese, um, Vietnamese ma marriage migrants have just overtaken China. You know, like there every year there are at least six thousand Vietnamese women who go to Korea to marry Korean men. So is is this influx of people here and there? You know that is creating all these multi ethnicity. Um, intercultural communication and exchange of values that can complicate and but at the same time helps fans say within Southeast Asia and beyond consume and imagine about Korean in a more sophisticated way, you know, because most likely you will know somebody who has already been in South Korea and these are real people, real lived experiences that we are talking about that might not be exactly like the oppa that you see on K-drama, you know, that which perfect skin or like, and not just one oppa, okay, but two or three oppas like <laughs> fighting over each other for you. It might not be the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there was research out there that shows that Vietnamese women who watch these K-drama really do believe in that. So, yeah. So cultivation effects, media effects. Yeah. So where was I? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got lost after I, I talked about my oppa. <laughs> yeah. So again, so... Vietnamese fans were talking about when will we have our first authentic Vietnamese idol ever, you know? Like, and, and there has been debates online, like, what do you mean by the Vietnamese K-pop idol in Korea? It must be someone who was born in, grew up in Vietnam, and then moved to Korea to achieve their dream. But as we were talking about how rigid and how strict the training system is, how is, is that really possible, you know what I'm saying? Like, how cosmopolitan, how um, international do you have to be in order to make it in the industry? Mm -hmm. So 
you're describing the flow or flux of populations. Let's think about the flow and flux of music itself, right? So on the one hand, there's commercial forces. And I'm sure, Angie, you can tell us a bit about some of the commercial plans and forces which get the music into America and other parts of the world. But there's also underground or grassroots circulation. And I wonder what role we might ascribe to that in terms of how the music gets here and what its effects have been. So, Angie, can you talk with a top-down commercial? Um, could I ask what do you mean by top-down commercial? Well, I just mean the commercial industry spreading music into other markets mm. rather than grassroots mm. circulation of people pirating music, uh, sharing mixtapes, and any number of other ways that would be unauthorized distribution of music. So to get more PRs in uh, um, other countries and other cultures, um, we do um, send like cold emails too sometimes. And like, we do, like, unless the idols are very popular, they don't reach out to you first. So you would have to reach out to them first to get PRs and um, things done. And also we sometimes like open up an event for um, K-pop fans, like such a small idol sometimes do that for fans, so they attract more fans from other cultures. And uh, for example, ATs, this group that I used to work with, they also um, went on tour right after their debut. Like It was for North American tour. Although they didn't really have much fans before, after the tour, they gained like a lot of um, international fans. So there was even saying like, oh, Cape Koreans don't really know about ATs, but all the international fans do. So that's how K-pop kind of try to commercialize themselves. And also we do um, playlisting. That's, um, we sometimes partner with um, some platforms, music streaming platforms, and get our artists get promoted on the, some, some of like playlists, like such as K-pop Taebak or those kind of things so that artists get more attention. So yeah, that's how it works in the industry, I, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's like a very wonderful insight into platforms. Um, and like, I want to add on to that, like the role of political economy and also, as you said, like gra grassroots networking. In terms of political economy, I do want to mention that um, the discourse around K-pop no longer being a Korean pop, but global pop, it's not really, what I, from what I've noticed at least, it's not really circulated from America per se, but it's, Koreans also lean into it in a way. Because I do, like, the word global, <laughs> one of the, <laughs> aside from supply chain, it's like the two words that trigger me. It's like, um, it's in the, from the 90s, I believe, the, the idea of being global meant prestige. Like, like after the 80s, when there were like much more protectionist economic policies, when Korea began to join these like more advanced economic countries in like international organizations, that's when global became synonymous with prestige. And that's why a lot of like this discussion around K-pop being global is generated you know, from the country. But then also in the grassroots, grassroots level, I, I feel like I might, I can't, I think it's Professor Ji Young Lee um, who wrote BTS Art Revolution. Is that the book that I'm thinking of? Um, sorry. Um, she wrote about how that online networking that BTS did became like a great model for connecting with global audiences. So it, like before BTS, like it, it was very much controlled by companies and like a lot of like fandoms that were generated, like this idea that was generated from, well also like even with online networking that happens too. But they were like BTS was deemed more authentic in a way because of their online digital connection with fans. And right now, almost all the K-pop artists like really lean into that model. They all have names for their big fan bases. They have, um, like, uh, what's that platform? Bubble? Is that? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where Weavers, they get, yeah, yeah, yeah. V, yeah. V Live. It's like, they get more like um, intimate connection with K-pop artists. So it's like, you see these changes happening, like in all these multiple levels, you know, as Angie mentioned too. No, I'm glad that you brought that up. That was something that I was thinking about, too, as far as the seeming accessibility of K-pop stars, right? Is that you can actually have a conversation with them, right? In a way that I feel like a lot of, uh, you don't get to have that kind of 
interaction with a lot of other types of celebrities, right? Um, and I think that that is also reflected with this idea of like fan events and things like that. So there is very much an intentional like, oh, we're here for you. We're actually a community. Like, I know you, even though you're only one of the millions of people that love me, right? So there is very this real kind of, um, or at least given the appearance of this accessibility. But I also think that it does have to do with kind of community circulation in the sense of like, when I think about my first K-pop video I ever saw, right, it was a friend who recommended it to me. It wasn't like I was in the store and or heard it on the radio or something like that, right? It's very much being circulated within community groups through social media. And so I do think that it's not really a, a coincidence that like this boom in K-pop as global accompanied the prevalence of social media and uh, digital media more specifically. So it does have a lot to do with that. And, um, and language, right? It also has a lot to do with language. And the labor that fans put into it, like the amount of fans who spend hours and hours and hours and hours subtitling and translating information and don't get paid for it at all. It's just like, for credit in the community or just for the fact that I want other people to be able to hear what they're saying, right? So I think that fan labor is also, does a lot of the legwork for the circulation of K-pop as well. Yeah, so I've been looking at the flow of Asian media into the US over the last 20 or 30 years. And what we often find is the intersection of two groups. One are a diasporic population that is trying to maintain contact back home to the culture they are coming from. But the other, on this side, are what I call pop cosmopolitans. That is, they are young people who are seeking difference from the parochialism of their own community and feel like they need to seek it elsewhere in the way that, say, a slightly older generation of mine would have sought it through foreign films and opera and painting and wine. They're seeking it through anime and Bollywood and K-pop. And that seems to have been the phenomenon that your whole generation has grown up in. That certainly we can see it back 20, 30 years. Different waves of different Asian national media pop culture finding its way into the US. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about the interplay of those two groups when we think about K-pop here in America. You were saying that you know, your first exposure was through a friend, right? So was that a Korean nationalist, or was that uh, an American who discovered K-pop, or what in between? Can we think a bit about what transactions may be taking place between those groups? Because to some degree, you need both in order to establish this flow that will gradually educate people about a cultural tradition that isn't necessarily already that deeply rooted here or maybe rooted in a particular ethnic community and, and ethnic grocery stores, say, and hard to get out of. Yeah. When I think about like that first experience, for me it was a friend who, um, she's from a very like multiracial family. Her father was like Scottish and her mother was from Singapore. Um, so there is this kind of element of Southeast Asian fans um, and diaspora invoked in that, um, that I think your brings up, kind of addresses some of the things that you're asking. Um, but I also think that like, as far as the circulation and the tension between kind of this idea of pop cosmopolitans that you throw around, I think that is interesting to think about K-pop within that context, because like you were saying, there's anime, um, there's also, uh, like kung fu movies and things like that. And all of these present a, a space of engaging or consuming popular culture that is seemingly distinct from kind of the Western or the, the white American, especially in the American context, right? White American popular culture. And so there is to a certain extent this idea of like looking for someone who is, has also been othered, right? And this resonance, right, of oh, this, they know a little bit about what it's like because they're not, they may not be the same as me, but they're also not the white guy, right? And so there is this kind of cultural resonance that comes from that and that solidarity in that sense um, that can be felt by a lot of pop cosmopolitans. And I think that also lends itself to K-pop becoming a site for activism in fandom communities because a lot of the people that identify with it 
are people who feel alienated or marginalized and are sensing in it this kind of s seemingly counter hegemonic possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree with Tierra there because um, I think for both diasporic uh, fans or consumers of K-pop or Korean culture and, uh, you know, these like pop cosmopolitanisms, like these groups of people who, who may look elsewhere than the sort of mainstream American um, portrayal of, you know, music or, or you know, visual content. Um, for both, it is a sort of um, reassertion of their perhaps minority kind of status. Um, it's this, and I'm also kind of speaking from experience too, like a sort of comfort in seeing people who look like me or who don't look like, you know, a sort of majority population that I'm used to um, on screen. And I think there's something really valuable about that. Um, although, it, like the question of the interplay between the two communities though, is something that I'm not sure about because um, I think, you know, for example, maybe a, a Korean American fan might approach K-pop in a different way to a yeah, like um, um, yeah, an African American woman. So, and I wonder if there are if it's possible also for these two groups of people to never interact because a lot of fandom is online. A lot of it is kind of me and the screen and the platform and the idol. Um, yeah, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on that. But to me, basically, the interplay seems... I haven't really seen it that much yet. Yeah. yeah. Interplay, hmm. Because, like, yeah. I wasn't necessarily thinking between, like, Korean-Americans and, I guess, like, Black American fans here. Um, but I could get into that. But, like, for me, like, and this is not, like, an academic observation at all. Um, just <laughs> hear me out. Um, so <laughs> it's, I joke that, um, <laughs> like, I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm Korean, but I'm not Korean-American. I don't have, like, um, a citizenship here. But I did grow up here, so it's, like, a weird experience. But I joke that, like, at 4 a.m. when I'm at BCD Tofu, like, just pound, like, <laughs> just <laughs> so drunk. It's, um, I used to, when I was younger, I used to be able to tell apart Korean-Americans and like Korean, Korean, Koreans, again, like not to be, not to be reductive, you know, it's like not an academic observation again. Um, it's really interesting because back then it was in, it was like, it's still the early 2000s. K-pop didn't really reach here as like this popular cultural force. And Korean, like Korean Americans kind of rejected it, in my opinion. I couldn't bring like Korean panchan to yeah, school. I was no, bullied. I, I was so bullied, like smelly kimchi. Like, it's like, what, like, yeah, things like that. But now it's like, I can't tell them apart. I can't, I, when I go to BCD Tofu, like, get my, my ticket, please. It's like, like, I don't know, 68B. It's like, I can't tell who's like a Korean, Korean, like, on this tour, like, touring Los Angeles or like the Korean Americans. It's really funny. So, like, and I go back to like that idea of liminal masculinity. Um, like, Asian American activism has taken on a much more masculinist. I think, like speaking from a cultural studies perspective, it took on a more masculinist perspective since the, like since the 60s, 70s, I believe, um, because of that idea of Asian men being effeminate, and it had like it's the un, like you know, undersides as well. But now with this like new Korean American, like Korean culture and Asian culture, as a popular force coming in, I think like you know it's like that distance between the diaspora Korean audience and just Korean audience, it has, it has reduced, I believe. Yeah, that's like my input in that, if anyone else has. I also agree on Ray. Um, if you work in the industry, you see a lot of kyopos, like second or third generation in, uh, from Korea. Um, Blackpink's digital account manager is also like kyopo. And also, Chun Somi's digital account manager at Interscope is also Kyopo. And even my boss in the black label in Korea, he's also Kyopo. He doesn't speak Korean that well, but he is Kyopo. So I asked, like, why do you work in K-pop? Like, I, because he, he's not, he's Korean's not too good, but he does want to work in this industry. So I was like, oh, why do you want to work in this industry? And he says, what he said was very interesting to me. He said, it resonates. Although I've never been to Korea before this, before this industry, like I was very resonating with Korean. And I, sometimes I don't really understand lyrics, but I could resonate. Them being on television, American television, that, that resonated with them. So I thought it was um, very interesting to see Kyopo's and K-pop industry in Korea. 
but that's what that's what then moved to Korea. So I, I thought it was interesting. Well, part of my efforts to explore pop cosmopolitanism led us to do some ethnographies in dorms back at when I was at MIT. And what we observed in dorms is groups of people living in close proximity. If one of them listened to a style of music, it spread very rapidly through the dorm. Or if they watched a kind of video, either film or TV series from somewhere else that their parents sent to them or something, that that would become a phenomenon in that dorm and maybe spread from that dorm outward, which is, would suggest, if the same were true here at USC, say, that uh, college cultures are really vital for this interplay between the, the diasporic community and pop cosmopolitans as they're seeking a way to differentiate themselves. And one depends on the other for exposure, for education, for supply. But the pop cosmopolitans are the ones who help spread it into the dominant culture in the US or in whatever other culture, non-originating culture we're talking about. Um, something that I'm thinking about listening to Ray and Heju, also Angie's comments, is this, um, I'm wondering, and maybe it's already happening, I'm not sure. I don't have much exposure, like you were saying, Hedju, I don't have much exposure with this like actual interaction between like American fans and specifically like Korean American. But I am wondering to you, like, to what extent does is there a type of fetishization that's happening as a result of this? Like, you know, when Kung Fu movies really became big, right, there became the stereotype of, oh, you're Asian, do you know Kung Fu? And so I'm wondering if there's a similar development happening with K-pop of like, oh, you are you look Asian, do you listen to BTS? Like, is there this kind of like assumption about your cultural priorities in that sense that's also arising from that? Or the expectation of, oh, you should be stylish like <laughs> because of all the K-pop idols that are so stylish and how that is maybe contributing to or not contributing to the kind of fetishization of Asian Americans in the US too. Yeah, you're hitting on something I wanted to ask you all about. We were in a moment not a year or so back when BTS was one of the most popular artists our, our groups in the US where Squid Game was top in 60 national television streaming systems when Parasite had just won best picture and yet we were seeing a massive rise in Asian American hate and speech and hate violence in the United States. So how do we rationalize the coexistence of those two things? Not to imply that necessarily K-pop fans were responsible for anti-Asian violence but they at least exist in the same culture where if we're assuming media exposure has some consequences, we would think it was moving in a more favorable direction toward Asian and Asian American peoples. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to observe, this um, friction between the cultural realm and the political realm. Um, because also speaking from, my gosh, um, it was during COVID, we were all on lockdown, and I was like downstairs of my apartment building, like getting something from Grubhub, wherever I was uh, ordering from. And I remember this was, a, I remember this, because I, I, I just came out of um, like a, like Instagram, uh, my Instagram feed where everyone was like making that, like that, that Taigona coffee. They were like, yeah, it's like this is Korean, like it's culture. And then um, this man in a bicycle, just like, um, went by me and called me a slur, like called me an Asian slur. Um, and, and then he followed that up with like perfect Korean, like calling me like the exact same word. Um, and I was like, I don't know, I was kind of impressed um, to be honest. <laughs> but, um, but that moment, like it's like, it was really illustrative of me how that political, like even if there's like a popular cultural movement happening, it doesn't really solve structural issues in a way. Um, 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 and like as you mentioned, like Squid Game and Parasite, it's um, and like it, it goes beyond just like um, just the American context. Um, and like, I don't want like I don't want to be too like you know my article, um, but it's like <laughs> I discuss. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, it's about Squid Game. I write I wrote about um, it's coming out in Communication, Culture, and Critique. Um, <laughs> um, it's I write about how 
American um, journalists here are interpreting as this like, Americans here love Squid Game because we're facing the same enemy, global capitalism. But the thing is, they don't realize that what's happening in Squid Game, that like fascination with like fantastic wealth accumulation, lottery, foreign, um, like illegal foreign labor, um, racism, it, um, or like, um, what else? Like, oh, lax union laws. It happened, like, not, like, not that, it's not archaic history. Like, if ever since early 2000s, when, like, with the IMF crisis, when America started to intervene in Korean economy, things began happening. Like, all the things you see in Squid Game, it's because of, like, Western influence, like, or interventions. And they're, and them saying, like, oh, like, we're facing the same enemy. It's, like, it's ridiculous to me, in a way. So, yeah, it's, like, the, like it, it, those are, it's beyond just, like, the American structural level of Asian Americans um, facing, like, these racist, like, racist structure of society. It's also, it also goes global, you know, in a way. Yeah, it's a... No, thank you so much and, and for sharing your experience and congratulations on the publication. So, um, <laughs> so um, as, as a Southeast Asian, and, and thank you so much, Tiara, for bringing that discussion about uh, people assumptions of you, stereotyping of you just because you're Asian up. Um, as a Southeast Asian, um, I hope to research how non-Korean Asian teenagers are dealing with this flow of global K-pop, for example, and what it means to them. And so this is still in proposal stage, but specific specifically for my dissertation, I hope to interview Vietnamese American teenagers. And so far I've talked to a couple of them and their sharing with me has been quite illuminating. So one girl particularly, she told me, you know, as a Vietnamese American, uh, girl, I listen to K-pop just so that I can get along with my friends, which signify the fact that K-pop has become the mainstream popular music. If you want to talk to your friends, you had better listen to K-pop, right? So, but then at the same time, she said, I also consume V-pop, but nobody knows V-pop in my circles. And the V-pop, Vietnamese pop, V-pop stands for Vietnamese pop. Um, not V, the BTS. Yes. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I cannot resist. Yeah. So, but then my friends might not consume V-pop. My parents might not understand the V-pop that I'm consuming, and so it seems that she was struggling with uh, multiple identities and negotiations of different cultural values here. And so I guess this is a specific case where we don't see her attempt to be in connection with her diasporic Vietnamese community, it doesn't overlap with her n attempt to try to be cosmopolitan. Because the cosmopolitan that she's seeking is very East Asian. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's mainstream, it's great, and, and, and it helps. But how about Southeast Asian cultural values, right? Who is going to be there for her, especially if she doesn't speak Vietnamese? So there's a lot of tensions that I hope to tease out, and thank you so much for bringing the conversation into this very important point. Yeah, no, thank you for all your anecdotes. Um, I, it's interesting, just as, you know, as your colleague listening to you guys, because it seems like we're we're all sort of seeing this tension between uh, what is like the fantasy, the kind of glittery image of Asianness or Koreanness that we see in K-pop or Korean media, versus like the disconnect between like actual lived experiences of like Asians in America, and and that is kind of highlighted in like the the co-presence of K-pop right, and Korean culture rising in popularity and at the same time uh, sort of anti-Asian violence. And um, I mean, from my knowledge, uh, there are different groups and different demographics of Asians involved in these two, gr uh, these two kind of phenomenon. But um, yeah, like sometimes what you see in K-pop is not you know, the, the Korean that you see sitting next to you at BCD Tofu. So, yeah, so um, we're seeing this disconnect, I, I feel, yeah. Hmm. That, that is in, in and of itself a sort of violence. I, I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions in just a minute, so be pulling your thoughts together while I ask one more round of questions here. I wanted to bring us back to where we began with this idea of K-pop or, or as a global phenomenon. 
And what qualities of K-pop do you think have resulted in that expansion beyond the Korean market into this global landscape? We've picked on uh, several throughout this, but I wonder if we, there's more to be said there. I think so. I mean, Hedu was just kind of mentioning this idea of the glittery and the glitz and the glam. And I do think that part of K-pop's appeal is this like idea of the spectacle, right? Of this idea of K-pop as representative of this um, very, this lifestyle that emphasizes consumption, right? Of like having all of the nice clothing, um, and all of these kind of idea, this idealization of what it should look like, whether you're, it, it's about relationships, like love songs, uh, whether it's about the body and how the body should look, emphasis on parentheses around should look, right? Um, and these kinds of notions of what things should be, um, I think that also is a part of what resonates for a lot of people is like, I think that we can feel right? The disconnect between the way that we live and what we see as in these music videos and in this kind of culture of consumption that is very curated, right? And so it does address those desires, but doesn't actually give like tangible ways to do something about it. But I do think that it is the desire there that, uh, and that, and that is very much embodied in the spectacle of the K-pop performance of like being able to go and and like live this cosmopolitan lifestyle where you can go anywhere you want to and people will love you and you can wear anything and afford anything. Um, so I do think that that is also indicative of this kind of consumerist lifestyle that we all have. Of like you buy as representative of what you want, but also as representative of like your political actions. So I think it also ties back to the previous question too. Just adding on to that idea of cosmopolitan spectacle, I think like um, Becky also put it very eloquently. It's um, I also not an academic observation. Um, my goodness, I used to joke that um, the experience of an Asian in America in the early two thousands was very much <laughs> just saying I'm not Chinese. It's the Hamad like Asianness. It's like it's it's not monolithic. Right, the idea of Asian Americanness, even more so, like it's like there are so many strands of identities that are involved in Asian Americanness, um, but it's like you know with the rise of K-pop, that structural, also a structural issue, hasn't been really resolved. But as also like a lot of our panelists have spoken about, it has opened up conversations with like this like new types of platforms that we see like you know we began to realize like oh it's not just koreans or just like asians consuming k-pop there's much like there's so much more to it and even within you know the asian popular culture there's like it's not just northeast asians that's like very representative of what asian is to america there's you know there's it, like india vietnam like it's this giant identity that part of what Asia is. I think that discussion is starting to happen, but hasn't really come forth in sadly, like, um, I don't know, more productive force. That's, mm. Well, thank, join me in thanking this remarkable panel. We've got some amazing students here at USC.